Welcome to Crossroad Connection. We're speaking out for those left unheard. My name is David Scheringa. I'm the president of Crossroad Bible Institute and a host of your program. And today I have in the studio with me today a very special guest and special friend, uh, Dr. Tim Spikstra. Tim is the senior pastor of the Cross Point Community Church um, in Chino, California. And he knows and has tremendous experience in this whole area of prison ministry. So we're going to have a delight to be able to talk together about that today. Welcome, Tim. Thanks, Dave. Great to be here. It's good to have you here. And um, yeah, we go back many, many years. Mm. Why don't you tell the folks where, where we go back to? Yeah, way back to uh, days at Esc in Escondido, California. Uh, you were my professor. Uh, one of my hardest professors, by the way. Really, most difficult? <laughs> Is that right? Yes, but learned a great deal. Uh, yeah, you were my preaching professor, uh, church government professor, some electives. And so I got to know you really there. Right. So it was, um, yeah, a, 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 it, it, we actually struck up a very good relationship uh, together. And uh, we did a lot of praying together yeah, yeah. and uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, you, uh, you started a Bible study with uh, a group of, of students. And uh, hmm. I don't know if you remember that, but that was a great, great experience. We went over J.I. Packer. Uh, book oh, together. Oh, did we study J.I.? Yeah, his book on the Spirit. Was yeah, that? yeah, 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 yeah. Remember that. And yeah. so, yeah. Keep in step with the Spirit. Yep. J.I. Packer. Yep, yep. Good stuff. It was wonderful. Um, as a student at Westminster Seminary, which, which by the way, um, yeah, we'll be talking about that. Uh, you got involved in prison ministry. Mm -hmm. Was that what, pretty much in the first year there, right away? Yeah, it was uh, towards I think the end of the first year. Uh, I went to a Bill Glass prison weekend. They are partners of ours now. Yeah. Oh, awesome. In fact, yeah. I'm going to be seeing their CEO in April wow. in Dallas. Yeah. So that's how you got your start, a Bill, Gr a Bill, Bill, Bill Glass, Glass yeah. weekend. Yeah, a, a friend who is living. For, for our listeners, uh, for our viewers, Bill Glass is the largest evangelistic prison ministry in the, in the world, probably, mm. especially mm. in this country, mm. right, where mm -hmm. they, they go in and just do these huge events. And you, you became part of that. Yeah. It, w it was up in San Francisco, um, San Quentin. In San Quentin. In San Quentin. And we would just go cell to cell and just meet, meet the guys, share with them, share the gospel with them. And uh, I was just overwhelmed. Uh, At what? Just going in. I, first of all, yeah, first of all, it's scary going into it prison. Was, it was first scary time. going Doors in. Are Doors are clanging. Doors are clanging. And we were actually... <laughs> In the in the room where all the sales were, and we you know, they're behind the bars, and I had never experienced anything like that. Right, uh, then you have to life. sign you have to sign a, a release, right, that says uh, if you are taken hostage, we will not negotiate. Exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and I, and quite frankly, I went just because for the experience, um, but it was overwhelming because you just felt the presence of God in a powerful way, it's something that, you know, I, I had my own views of what I thought prisoners were or, you know, should they, why they should be there, but it really got ar arrested my heart there. And uh, everybody seems to remember their first time in prison, mm -hmm. visiting a prison. Mm -hmm. it just, it's just has this, can have this profound effect, I guess, if you're called a prison ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after the Bill Glass weekend, and you would would you still recommend people get involved with Bill oh, Glass? Absolutely. Sign absolutely. up, go yeah. in there, go to the website. It, it's a life life changing yeah. thing. Yeah. So what happened after that weekend with Bill Glass? Well, you know, I thought it was great. I'd hope to do another one with them someday. But got back to to seminary, and uh, the president of the seminary, his name was Bob Dindalk at mm -hmm. the time. He um, was getting letters from prisoners and uh, they were asking for guys to come up and just do teaching, do preaching. Uh, it was at Corcoran Prison yep. in Central California. That was so, not so, long ago. so he had heard, he said, hey, I heard you went to a prison. Would you like to go? Wow. Deal? I've known you all these years. I didn't realize that that's how that got started. Yeah, so yeah. Bob Dundalk, who was my boss yep. at that time, who has passed away. Mm -hmm. And by the way, his widow, Nellie, 
is on our board. Our board. Wow, our that's, board that's here. crazy. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and stuff. And I know her son's real well, too. But Bob, heard, he's getting all these letters from prisoners. Mm -hmm. And he heard, you were in prison once. <laughs> yep, yep. And that's how he says, would you like to go? And so I said, sure. I thought it was going to be, again, a one-time deal. And we, uh, it was a five-hour drive up to Corcoran. It's a long drive up there. Yeah, five hours. It's way out there in the <laughs> desert. <right? laughs> and then we spent five hours in prison going, I think, three yards I preached in. Five hours you were preaching. Yeah, and then five hours back. So it was a huge Saturday. And you were much younger. I was much younger. <laughs> crazy. And uh, it went so well, even though I had no idea what I was doing. It went so well, they wanted us to continue that on a monthly basis. So... Every month, and then I would take some guys from my okay, seminary. Okay, so with you me. were the one that got other seminarians mm -hmm. involved, mm -hmm. and you were going all the way out to Corkin all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once a month. Once a month. And then you, you'd all hit the cells. We would no, there we, they would come into the chapel. Ah. So we would we would preach in a chapel, and then they'd move us to another chapel on a different yard. And so we got up to five different chapels that we were doing uh, different yards at Corcoran. The the, uh, the chaplain there must have been very very open yeah. to this and stuff. You must uh, been Elijah Owens was his name. Elijah Owens, uh, good guy, and he he loved what we were doing. And then we start setting libraries up. We would through the Dundalk Foundation. That's right. That that became their forte to set up theological libraries yep. in prisons. Yep. So then, then word got out, so other prisons start asking us to go and went up to Folsom and New Folsom and yep. Donovan Prison and Calipatria Prison and uh, some federal prisons. And so it just kind of took off in libraries. So you look, you look back at this, you know, with, with, uh, with Dr. Dendalk and yourself, um, it just was sort of like just, just the Holy Spirit was just uh, lit a fire. Nobody, yeah. nobody planned it. Oh no, there was no. there was no, there was no ten year plan <laughs> no. and all that. Yeah, and I, I was just I was in seminary. I didn't know how to preach or anything, so it was totally a god. That's true. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Till I had your course. Oh yeah. Once I had your course, then, then I learned how to that preach. That transformed yeah. everything. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. well you, you, you were a, a, a unique homiletic student because I think you were the only one that never used notes. Yeah. You know, just, <laughs> you, you just and, go up there and preach. Well, and one of the reasons that in prison, if, you can't. If, you, you, if I use notes, I would lose their attention. Yeah. So yeah. I actually had to learn to preach. That's with, where you got your extemporaneous um, style yeah, from prison. If, if you didn't look at them and keep their attention, um, they would be drifting off. So if you look down or read your notes, it, it, it just it didn't work. It is funny how, and I, we can't get into this a whole homiletics discussion because we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> take a break here in a second. But uh, it's funny because like uh, when I preach at your church, Cross Point, which is a very charismatic, explosive thing, I, you can't use notes either. Mm -hmm. You know, you just you just gotta preach, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you go to a mainline church that's really highly educated and so forth. If you don't read your sermon, it's like this guy's just winging it. Exactly. They, you know, they, they, want, they want a carefully prepared yep. academic exercise, right? Yep. So yep. context is yep. everything. Yep. Well, after the break, I want to talk about how um, you got a certain professor involved <laughs> in prison ministry. And uh, we'll be right back. The Center for Advanced Studies at Crossroad Bible Institute is sponsoring continuing education seminars for instructors and interested church members. These seminars cover a range of issues from restorative justice to responding to Islam. Seminars are open to everyone and free of charge, but advanced registration is required. To find a seminar in your area or to register for an upcoming seminar, go to cbi.fm on the web. Welcome back to Crossroad Connection. My name is David Scheringa. I'm in the studio today with Dr. Tim Spikstra. And Dr. Spikstra and I have been talking about how he, how you, as a seminary student, serendipitously, or we would say providentially, mm -hmm. uh, got involved in a Bill Glass weekend, which we would highly recommend. Those are partners to us. I, Bill Glass go, still goes into prisons, I mean, their organization all over the country. And what they do is after their evangelistic event or going to thing, they give them a crossroad enrollment mm -hmm. form. 
And so we have hundreds, thousands of, C- of CBI students, you know, from Bill Glass. But you had that incredible experience. You came back to seminary. Bob Dundalk, my boss, president of, Crossroad, uh, president of Westminster Seminary, were getting these letters um, from prisoners asking for theology help. And then he heard about this Tim Spikester who's, well, you've been in prison, you're experienced. (laughs) And then you got involved with other students going into Corcoran and Folsom and all of that. Now, in the meantime, there was this professor teaching ecclesiology and pastoral theology and especially homiletics. And the the students, like uh, Tim Spikester, would come to me after class and say, Professor Scheringa, you, you need to come with us into the prisons. And um, I immediately jumped at the chance, right? <laughs> <laughs> you got to twist a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, in fact, I, I, I remember I thought, this is, why would I do that? Uh, I, I, you know, at that time, I, I really had no vision for prisoners. I was supposed to train seminarians, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you guys kept on me. Mm-hmm. And you, you said, you just got to come, got to come. So I, I finally gave in. Mm-hmm. Did, didn't we go to Corcoran? We went to Corcoran and Folsom. I remember Folsom. Was that the same time? Uh, no. No, no. Two different. The, the very mm-hmm. first time was Corcoran. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I still tell people about that experience mm. because it was my jail conversion mm-hmm. <laughs> experience of the doors clanging behind you. And you guys are probably just watching me, watch, watching this stuffy old professor <laughs> coming there, right? That's where I learned you can't preach with those two. <laughs> but what I remember is something which you experienced too, is that um, when I was in that Corcoran, I thought this, this, these are the people Jesus would hang out with. Absolutely. And that's something that Absolutely. never, never left me, even mm-hmm. though it was many years since that I became the president of Crossroad. Mm-hmm. And then we went, that's right, you guys took me to Folsom, Folsom, Folsom mm-hmm. Prison, which mm-hmm. as a Johnny Cash fan, that <laughs> that meant so much to me. Yeah. Uh, remember, do you remember that that was at Christmas time? Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. As, we were in a, we were sitting in among the students, among, among the inmates, mm. singing Christmas carols mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. I came up to preach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you remember this, but I'm going to go back to ask a new question, but I'm, I'm reminiscing here a little bit. I don't know if you remember this, but what grabbed me is uh, when those inmates, all these tough, tattooed, big guys, sang away in the manger. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and then when they got to the verse, be near me, Lord mm, Jesus, mm. I ask you to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Mm. Wow, mm, mm. Uh, I, I I still get goosebumps, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, from from that. You continued uh, after seminary to work with the Dendalks, mm-hmm. um, and you got involved a bit with the an early version of Crossroad Bible Institute. Yeah, yeah. So your your connection to Crossroad Bible Institute far precedes mine. Um, so you would go in and then get. Get the st- get the inmates after you would preach involved in Crossroads. Is that how that started? Yeah, we would do a service, and then we would say, "Hey, anyone wanting wanting to be discipled, we would give them an application." Right. Yeah. Right. And then the church we planted, um, you know, you spearheaded the the really the inmate ministry of that of that church plant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, not only getting people in our church involved as instructors, but also we made some feeble attempts at re-entry. <laughs> <laughs> right? I yeah, mean, uh, hard, it, hard. it was, I mean, and I have used that experience to, as a cautionary yeah. thing for churches yeah. because um, we, we brought some guys out and I mean, these guys were good theologians. Yeah. Right, what were some of their names again? Uh, Paul. Paul, Paul, I remember Paul. Paul, Pete, okay. Fred. Pete, Pete, that's right. Uh, and they, they, they knew theology. Yeah. But um, we, we didn't know what we were doing, really. Mm-hmm. We were probably a bit romantic. Yeah. Idealistic, you know. This, you know, and, and and it didn't work out. And what I tell folks today in churches, tell me if I'm right. You know, you got to train people. Yeah. 
got to train churches. Reentry is important. I mean, would you agree? Absolutely. Should the church be able to embrace people who were incarcerated? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But it is not easy, as you said. I mean, we learned the hard way. Right. Uh, well, we had no we had no clue about the institutionalization mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that takes place. We had no idea. Um, well, you know, the fact is that there's a lot of dysfunction there. I mean, because committing a crime is a boundary violation <laughs> and, and stuff. But um, the church needs to be involved in prison ministry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What have you seen the church as a pastor of a very large congregation, Cross Point Community Church, um, and a very diverse church, beautiful, you see so much the body of Christ, uh, what advantages are there for the church to be involved in prison ministry and in helping guys in reentry? Well, I think the what happens is what happened to you, um, and when I w went in the first time, it will ruin you because you see Jesus. You know Matthew twenty five. When you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. And so what happens? People go in. And they're never the same. We have a group from our church that goes in and plays basketball in a local prison. And these are, you know, six, eight guys, you know, athletic. And it's amazing, Dave, watching them uh, come out, some of them for the very first time come out, and they're so full of joy um, because they just play basketball with Jesus. I mean, <laughs> literally, literally, I mean, it, in that it's, yeah, and, and, so they come back, and it changes their whole perspective on This wasn't people. even a Bible study. No, no, no. This and we have, a, like, a prayer time at the end. Um, but you're, they're encountering uh, the, the, at Matthew 25. And so they, they are changed, and it gives them a heart for uh, God's kingdom and how big God's kingdom is. And So you're talking about having a group from your church go in to play basketball and it's becoming it's became a life changing experience. Oh yeah, I think every guy that has gone in, um, it's it's a, a form of discipleship that they their eyes are opened by the Spirit to, yeah. hey, Jesus is in prison. And they may not be too comfortable a uh, discipleship thing where they're teaching in front of the Bible, but they're great. They're okay playing basketball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting way to get them in. But once they get in, and and we've had guys who've done that that have become mentors. One-on-one uh, yeah. -on -one mentors. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and so it's. I think it, it opens people's hearts to God's kingdom, broadens them, and uh, they're never the same. Yes, and that's how is that good for a local church? Well, not only you know are they ruined for people the individuals, in, but how about for the church as a whole? What yeah. difference does it make? Oh, I think it gives the church a spark. It gives a mission. It gives them an understanding that uh, our, you know, we have to get outside of the walls, not just to prison, but to the hurting and the broken yeah, and people yeah. in our society. And, and so it just broadens the mission of the church in multiple ways. Right. That because the heart of Jesus is in that and they've experienced that and they want more of that. And so they can't stay within the four walls of church anymore. They got to break <laughs> out because God's kingdom is so big. As a as a as a uh, as a doctor in theology and uh, in your own, your own experience, have you found a relationship between church revival and prison ministry? Absolutely. How does that Absolutely. work? Absolutely. You know, it, I, just a story. When back when um, we were planting a church, and uh, we brought a guy, and we you remember you brought in the worship band um, one. Uh, Sunday, and we did a worship service in uh, Donovan State Prison. We did. Yes. So we brought in... That a, was a nightmare. <laughs> it that was. So you hated it. <laughs> but there was a guy who came with us who grew up in, his, in the church his whole life, and um, he helped set up. His I name was Brian. That. And uh, he was listening to, in the back, I think he was doing the sound system, and he was listening to the guy sing Amazing Grace. Yeah. And he just raised his hands, started crying, and he would really say that his heart was transformed to really knowing Jesus Christ at that moment. At that moment. 
in the midst of uh, the prisoners. Because he's a reform guy, or you don't raise your hands. You don't do that. that your hands never go above your <laughs> nose in church. <laughs> but he was so moved. And that's just one story yeah. of a person transformed. And later, he, uh, he helped plant his own church. I mean, he was a businessman, owned a business. Yeah. Um, but his heart was so changed by that experience that he would never be the same. Uh, so. Well, it's it's a life changing experience. People out there, um, they learn, don't they, that uh, they went in to help these poor prisoners, mm -hmm. but they come out blessed. Changed, yeah. They come out changed, yeah. maybe even more than the per person in oh, prison. It is God's master plan. I think <laughs> we're going to go and we're going to help, and and what happens is God transforms us transforms us yeah, yeah yeah we're the ones changed what, what is exactly his, was his intention yeah, yeah. why he wants that yeah after the break um we, we have a few minutes yet i want we got to talk international okay I mean, we, there's so much we need to talk about <laughs> because you were all lined up f to for crossroad to go to africa to train over 200 pastors and then uh, a, a terrorist alert was put out mm -hmm. and we had to postpone the trip unfortunately mm -hmm. but that's what I want to talk about we'll be right back are you in prison do you know someone who is through CBI Bible studies and encouragement from CBI instructors more than 40,000 people behind bars are learning the truth about salvation through Christ and are developing deeper relationships with God for an enrollment form please visit us online at cbi.fm. Welcome back to Crossroad Connection. We're having a pretty fun discussion here with uh, Dr. Tim Spikstra. Uh, the first part of the program, we talked about how um, he got into prison ministry. The second part was about how that helps the church. But uh, there's a whole other area here that we have not talked about yet, is uh, your, your, your international vision for the church. Um, just just briefly, you've been to Africa a number of times and helping orphans, am I right? Yeah. Can you give us a, just a little overview of that? Yeah, uh, little country of Lesotho uh, has one of the highest HIV rates uh, in the nation or in the continent of Africa. And uh, yeah, it's an incredible way how God got us in involved there, but uh, growing ministry to uh, abandoned babies. So. And that's a big thing, and a big problem in Africa in general, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Orphans, mm -hmm. and uh, and Huge. so you go there, and do you do some preaching, and yep. go into the in, into the things, and um, recently we had you all set up to go to Africa for us uh, as an ambassador for CBI. It seemed to be a natural fit. They had asked me if I could go, but I couldn't, and so you graciously were planning on going, um, and. And our brand new uh, campus there had set up over 200 pastors mm -hmm. for you to teach. And they're going to keep you pretty busy <laughs> in the prisons, too. How many times were you going to be preaching? Uh, five times, I think, in one day. Five times yeah. in the preaching, stuff like that. But Crossroad is international ministry is just exploding. And this, will be, this, this is the second satellite campus in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But we had to, we had to cancel. Uh, not cancel, postpone, mm -hmm. because the the tensions between Muslims and Christians in Nigeria is very strong, and our government recommended against all but very essential travel. Mm -hmm. And um, do you agree it was a good decision? Would that have made? Could that you've been to Africa? Would it? Would a um, a, a room of two hundred evangelical pastors uh, been a tempting target? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, you just see the tension rising there too, and it would have been a, a great experience, but it would have been dangerous. And, um, but yet, uh, you said if, if in a heartbeat you'd still would have gone. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's um, those those are tough calls, but we've really you know told them that consider it a postponement not um, not a cancellation mm -hmm. and so the idea the idea of, of of traveling like that and going into those dangerous places um, that that's something you you feel a, a calling to do 
Yeah. And you, you enjoy doing that. Yeah. And uh, it's a good thing you come from California because it's kind of hot in some of those places. <laughs> yeah, so used to it. You're so, you're so used to it. Yeah, uh -huh. right. Yeah, I'll go to anything north of the equator. <laughs> you can go to any place <laughs> south of the equator. <laughs> you do that. Now, but what, what does the um, – let, let's talk about that for the last few minutes because mm -hmm. you've been going there, orphanages. Mm -hmm. We're talking about prison ministries. Lots of talk today about how helping can hurt. Have you learned anything along those lines in terms of where they can become dependent on us or feel entitled and we end up not strengthening the church? What have you seen? Yeah, and I think here's where discipleship comes in because if you come in and try to take over and they don't have ownership of the ministry, um, yeah, it won't be successful. It will be, de they'll be dependent on the U.S. or dependent on funds and lean way too heavily on us. And God has given, the, there's so many talented people, so many talented people in that continent that uh, part of discipleship is raising them up and the gifts and the talents and equipping them. Uh, and they can do it. They're just, they're, they're talented people, but they've just also haven't been taught. Just having to talk, they've there's been a dependency, um, colonialism perhaps yeah, exactly in a lot of those places colonialism. So, yeah. well, it's um, it, it's interesting because when you hear it's a big discussion right now about short term mission trips and mm -hmm. are they are they a good thing or a bad thing, um, and uh, I think we're coming to a consensus in the church that they can be a very good thing and they can be a bad thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I guess what, I, what I'm seeing is the same thing we were talking about earlier in the program. You go into the prison thinking you're going to help them, but you come out of the prison and realize that you've been inspired. And probably with many short-term mission trips, it's the same thing, isn't it? Where Absolutely. you say, oh, we're going to help you, we're going to paint your church or do this or that. But the funny thing is, they come back changed, all changed, yeah. and all excited, and it was a spiritual high for them. It, we need to recognize that somehow, mm -hmm, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That it's an equal exchange. We're not going out there into the third world or developing country uh, to help these poor suckers, right? You know, who are in such terrible shape. Uh, it's it, they're equal image bearers of God. We need them maybe even more than they need us. Is that too oh, strong? I, you know, I, I absolutely agree. I have learned, just like prison, I have learned going to Africa that these beautiful people have taught me so much about God, about the kingdom, about faith and trust and uh, joy in the midst of incredible sorrow and death. Can you, can you recall, I'm putting you on the spot here, a concrete example of this? Yeah, I remember uh, one of the first times I was in Lesotho um, visiting a home in a village of a lady dying with HIV AIDS. Remember her name? I don't remember. It was a long African oh, name. Long African so name. sorry, Dave. Right, 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 right. She was dying of AIDS. She was dying of AIDS. And you AIDS. went to her home. And I went in, and the, the family, um, uh, one of the daughters, she's about 13-year-old daughter, was the oldest one of the family uh, that would raise the rest of the kids. So here's an incredible, uh, in, in my mind, horrific situation. And what, what did the house look like? It was just uh, dirt floors, kind of. A hut. Yeah, a hut. And she was laying on the floor on a mat. Um, dying of AIDS. Dying of AIDS. And yet uh, in that room, in that little hut with her children, uh, the presence of God was so tangible. Really, and, and her joy, and her trust, and her faith that you know this life wasn't, uh, you know, there was another life coming. There was joy, joy in, in that in her, even in her death. Um, and uh, yeah, I look at that and just oh, this thirteen-year-old girl is going to have to raise the rest of the family, and yet somehow the presence of God was tangibly there, and there was still joy in the midst of that, which taught me uh, incredible. Uh, how God works in the midst of suffering because this lady dying of AIDS she still had a smile on her face she still could praise the Lord uh, and give thanks for her life even though she was passing away I had a very similar experience uh, down in Costa Rica where I mm -hmm. preached in a squatter's settlement 
and uh, there was some of these little children and people who their only set of clothes that they had on, you know. But I saw such joy in their eyes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we North Americans who have life so good um, just need to need to get with the program, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. The joy mm -hmm. is not in the stuff. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Uh, the joy is in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, y you don't have to be wealthy to enjoy it. No. You're probably better <laughs> off not, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a huge lesson that God teaches us. So these are the kind there. of experiences that um, that just sort of change a person mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. you're doing that. Well, we hope that very soon we can get you off to Nigeria and some other places and get those pastors' conferences uh, going. 200 pastors are, are, are waiting to hear from you. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure that you'll have a lot to teach them, and they'll have a lot to teach you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for being with us today, oh, Tim. Thank you. This was a blessing. This was a blessing. <laughs> Unexpected. <laughs> and uh, we've got to have you back again. Yeah, that's great. Because I'm sure there's a whole lot we could talk about. Mm -hmm. Here's a man of God who has been involved in prison ministry, his, his whole, basically your whole ministry one way or another, mm -hmm. uh, and just uh, has uh, inspired so many other people and has inspired Crossroad Bible Institute mm. and and a professor <laughs> uh, who never would have guessed that this is where he would uh, end up with his life's work. Mm. So thank you. Our blessings to uh, Patty and the kids and the Cross Point Church. And uh, just glad that you could be here. Yeah, and, thank you. And too. thank you for being here for another edition of, uh, Crossroad, of uh, Crossroad Connection. Speaking out for those left on her, we've been talking to Dr. Tim Spikestrip who is senior pastor of Cross Point Community Church and something of an international ambassador becoming for Crossroad Bible Institute. Thanks for watching, and we hope that we'll see you again right here next week.